Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to have you uh, in this concurrent session. If you're here and you are hoping to see crop performance and nutritional quality, you are in the right spot. I realize we're a little bit uh, uh, distributed because I realize also the screens are at uh, uh, both sides of the room, so I, we will be comfortable with that. My name is Stan Blade. I'm Dean of the Faculty of Agricultural, Life, and Environmental Sciences at the University of Alberta. We have about 1,600 undergraduates, about 530 graduate students, uh, and we have, over the last five years, an annual budget of external funding of about $45 million, very active in production agriculture, but other aspects of the environment, of food, of nutrition, and it's a great pleasure to have you all here. We have a tremendous session. Credit to Morris and the team. Uh, it's just been, I had high expectations coming to Saskatoon. Uh, they have all been met and more. Uh, and uh, the speakers that we have in this session, again, I'm sure will meet that high bar. Uh, so credit to the team that has brought all of this together. I'm going to introduce the first uh, speaker. In so many years of chairing international sessions, I've never been able to use this line before. Uh, I am responsible for knocking out the tooth of the daughter of our first speaker. Uh, you know, back in my days with IITA, uh, 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 Lena's daughter came over to a birthday party of one of our children, and there was a very active uh, balloon volleyball game, and uh, mistakes were made. Let's just say that at this stage. So our first speaker is indeed Dr. Lena Tripathi. Uh, Lena is a senior scientist uh, with the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture. Uh, she leads the Plant Transformation Unit. Uh, you will hear a remarkable story this afternoon about her work uh, uh, with banana. And I would only identify just one uh, element of her biography, that she has trained 30 uh, uh, graduate students and 200 short-term trainees, many of those uh, from Sub-Saharan Africa. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lena Tripathi. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizer for giving me this opportunity to um, uh, talk something about my work. Uh, so what I'm going to do today is uh, I'll talk particularly about the bananas, the GM bananas resistant for the Xanthomonas world um, and, uh, and the nematode resistance. And why bananas? You know, banana is like a fruit crop all over the world. But in Africa, it's a staple food crop and is the fourth most important crop. The, the overall production of banana is about 144 million tons per annum. Uh, and one third of that comes from Africa. Um, particularly, Uganda is a big grower. It's the second largest producer uh, um, uh, after India. You know, but in terms of the consumption, actually, Uganda is number one. And they can eat bananas, but they don't eat like a fruit. They, they have a staple food called machuke, which they can eat starting from the breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So you can understand how important that crop is for them. Um, but it's still, the production of banana is threatened with several uh, bacterial, uh, viral, uh, fungal diseases, but as well as a lot of pests like weevils and nematodes. So at IATA, we are collaborating with a lot of partners. We are focusing on pests and diseases. Um, but today, uh, keeping the, uh, the time in mind, I will give you two examples. One is the Xanthomonas world and the nematodes. Those are the two projects where we are actually much more advanced in comparison to the other projects. But we are also tackling the, the viral disease called banana bunchy top virus, which is also a big problem in bananas. So Xanthomonas world is caused by Xanthomonas campestris pathovirus mysosurum. It's not a new disease. Actually, it was reported in Ethiopia more than 45 years back on crop called NSET, which, which is similar to bananas, but is not bananas. Um, and then after that, uh, it was confined in Ethiopia for a long period of time. Then in Uganda, it was reported in 2001. Since then, actually, the disease is spreading very fast, and now it's, it's covering all over the East and Central Africa, the Great Lakes region, which is the major banana producing area in East Africa. Um, and, and so it's, it's actually in DR Congo, Rwanda, Burundi, Tanzania, and, and as well as in Kenya. Um, so the, dis the pathogen is very closely related to a bacterial which is Xanthomonas vesicula pathorum, uh, uh, vesicularum, which is a pathogen for sorghum, uh, sorry, for sugarcane, 
and it, it can also affect maize. So the, the, the Xanthomonas um, uh, for banana, Xanthomonas pathovirus musicorum, actually is very, very closely related to that. For a long time, actually, everybody was thinking that, you know, is a monomorphic uh, uh, pathogen. But recently, there was some sequencing, genome-wide sequencing was done in, in a lab in UK, and they revealed that, no, it's not monomorphic. Actually, there are two different groups. So Uganda, Kenya, um, uh, and, and Burundi is in one group. But then uh, DR Congo, Rwanda, and Ethiopia is actually in a different group. But it's still, the pathogenicity, pathogenicity of this one is quite similar. Uh, the production losses are pretty high uh, because once the disease enters into the field, actually it's completely wipe off the bananas very quickly. So the, the production losses are up to 83% in DR Congo and up to like 70, around 70% 70 in, in uh, Uganda. So you can see like, you know, that much loss of bananas are really huge. Um, and, and as I said, you know, because the, uh, it's, it's quite extreme and rapid, you know, so within few months, once the disease is in the field, it can, it can wipe off. And, and you cannot miss the disease once the disease is there because it is starts with the wilting of the leaves, uh, uh, the premature ripening of fruits. So even the fruits which looks quite good from, uh, from outside, when you cut them, they are all rotten from the inside, they have this brown scar, but also there is a yellow ooze, you know, which is like a peculiar symptom, and, and you can easily diagnose the disease because of, of that. Um, the disease mainly spreads by insect vectors. Uh, so what happens, you know, in banana, there are there is flower, in the male flower, the one, like a bract falls off, and it leaves the, the moist cushion, that's attract the insects. And that's how the insect, insects carry the pathogen from the infected bananas to the, to the non-infected. That's the major spread. But then it also spread through the planting material because I don't know how many of you know that, you know, banana, there is no seed. So it's, it's actually planted using the suckers, which are the babies coming out around the bananas. And then if the mother plant is infected, then those suckers can spread easily the disease. Uh, the farmer is spread it also using the contaminated farming tools and also through the trading because they use the banana sheet and the pseudo stem sheet to wrap the bananas and that's how the pathogen also spread actually long distance. Uh, uh, in terms of the susceptibility, actually all the banana varieties so far tested have been found susceptible. Um, but then there is not much significant difference in the pathogenicity among the different isolates. Uh, there are several labs was done that work, including my lab. So we have tested 50 different isolates uh, collected from different countries, and we didn't find any difference in the, in the pathogenicity of those ones. Um, even though all the cultivars are susceptible, but there is difference in the susceptibility among the cultivars. Like Pisanga wok, which is a beer banana, is the most susceptible. Um, and the interesting thing is there are some cultivars of particularly the East African highland bananas like Nekitembe, where they can escape the insect-mediated uh, transmission of the, of the pathogen because they have this persistent bracts, so the bracts doesn't fall off but they are not resistant. So if the farmers use the contaminated farming tool, they still get the infected. There is only one wild type banana, which is Musa balbiciana, which is found to be resistant. But then, you know, this is not the preferred parent for, for conventional breeding because, because of other problems. You know, like bee genome has this integrated banana streak virus problem, so, so breeders don't use it. And even though there is a resistant cultivar, you know, banana breeding, is, is a very complicated, difficult thing. Uh, so the disease can be managed using the cultural practices, uh, but then there is also, you know, the cultural practices are not well adapted by the farmers because they are very laborious, uh, but also the farmers themselves are very confused, you know, to, to just uproot the main plant which is infected, but also whether to uproot the whole mat. So, you know, one of my master's students, we were very curious to see, like, what's happening. So we did this work with the master student, and, and the student did the work. So they in, uh, what she did was she infected the, the male flower, which is the natural way of doing it. And then we used the PCR to detect the pathogen. 
So before she can detect the, before they can detect the, uh, sorry, the symptoms, you can detect the pathogen actually even in the sucker. So you can see it's a path vascular pathogen, so it moves very fast. So, you know, like recommending farmers only to uproot the, the plant which is infected is actually quite risky. So, so I think I'm not pretty much sure. I was trying to justify why we are doing the transgenic research, you know, because we, as, as, as Jennifer said yesterday, it's not a silver bullet, you know. We need a strong justification because it's a quite expensive and, and as well as the land we process, you know. So there are overall economic losses between two, two to eight billion over a decade. And as I said, you know, it leads to the absolute loss. Um, so that's why, you know, even for the other bacterial diseases, you know, resistance has been considered as the most cost effective and there is no resistant variety, so conventional breeding is not possible. That's why we started the project on the, on the transgenic. So, so what we are doing is we are using two different genes. One is plant ferredoxin like protein, and another is the hypersensitive assisting protein. Uh, both of them are cloned from the sweet pepper, which we all eat, that green bell pepper, the capsicum anum. And what these genes do is they intensify the hypersensitive response and it is actually a harpine uh, eliciter induced resistance, so which can basically provide the broad, broad spectrum, and that's why we are trying to use it. And this gene has been tested in several vegetable crops before, uh, and they has been shown resistance against different bacteria, including even xanthomonas. It has been tested in rice before, but nothing has been tested under the field condition. Everything was done in the glasshouse and, and the laboratory condition. So what we did, because our target was not like an upstream research only to publish, you know, we were always thinking of providing the solution to the farmer. So from the very first day, we developed the project uh, considering all the aspects of the, of the GM product, including like IP, including how we are going to disseminate the product once we are ready with the product. So what we did was we partnered with uh, AATF uh, and uh, so we, this the technology we, we got was that both the genes are actually from Academia Seneca Taiwan. And one of these genes has, uh, they have the patent in it, not even in Africa, but, but all other places. So, so what we did was uh, IAT approached AATF and, we, and AATF uh, negotiated with Academia Seneca for royalty free um, access to the gene. And so now we have actually freedom to operate um, and we can actually go up to the commercialization without making any payment. So the advantage of that is like farmers doesn't need to pay anything extra once the product is ready. And then this, this project also has a lot of capacity uh, building component because we are working very closely with the national partner. So we started it by, by developing the capacity for the, for the transformation. You know, transforming banana is not easy. Um, and, and then we went to the, so we, all the steps actually, we were doing the capacity building, including the glasshouse testing and the field testing. And in the end, we have the private, uh, uh, public-private partnership so we are also actually involving a lot of tissue culture companies from the starting itself so that they have the capacity to disseminate the material once our product is ready. So we developed, uh, um, okay, so it was a bit easy for us to go on the product because you know we had the very robust banana transformation a platform using the cell suspension. Developing cell suspension is quite tricky. It can take 18 to 24 months. But the good thing is once you have the cell suspension, you can use for the transformation for at least two, two years. You have to like maintain the cells. And, um, and, and then uh, once the cells are there, it takes like between nine months, nine to 10 months actually to develop the transgenic. So that's what we used. Uh, we, uh, we have actually, in, in the starting, we, for the proof of concept, we transformed uh, two varieties. Um, one is Sukalindizi, which is a desert banana grown in East Africa, is a small apple bananas. And, and another is an Echinica, which is a East African highland bananas. And we developed actually 100, about 100 lines for each cultivar using each of the construct. We use constitutive promoter for driving the genes because, you know, as you can see, like the pathogen can be affected from anywhere in the plant, you know, all the, so we cannot use the, the uh, promoter for um, tissue specific. Um, and then when, after developing the plants, we validated for the presence of the gene, and after that, 
we went for the testing. So what we did was we developed a, a quick screening method using the in vitro plants where we can inject um, a very small in vitro uh, transgenic plant. And, and the good thing about this is like, you know, between 10 to 12 days, the control plants gets the symptom. So it's really quick, you know. Uh, but we keep them at least for 60 days. The plants which don't see the symptom in 60 days, we, we take them out in the, for the glass house study. And in the glass house, actually, we found, uh, because we have already done the preliminary screening, so most of the lines actually showed resistance when we went to the glass house. Um, you can see that blue tag is the one where we have inoculated uh, uh, the pathogen into the leaves. The control plant actually got the symptom within one month, one month to 40 days time, you know, they have completely wilted. That's in figure C uh, in that uh, uh, picture. Um, and then the control uh, and then the, the transgenic plants, actually majority of them didn't show any symptom. Um, we also try to see like, you know, what's happening. So what we saw is like where the point where we have inoculated the pathogen at that particular point, you see uh, the necrosis. That necrosis is because of this cell death, which creates the physical barrier. And that's how normally the hypersensitive response is, you know, so it creates a barrier. So I wanted to see like whether exactly that thing is happening. So what we did is we tried to isolate the bacteria like five centimeter above the point of inoculation and five centimeter below the point of inoculation, we couldn't get any bacteria, which was proving that, you know, means like our hypothesis was correct. And, and we were not only doing it by one way, by PCR, but also on the selective media. So we tested by, uh, by two different performance. Uh, then we have, uh, based on the Glasshouse study, we, we selected the, the promising lines and we did the detailed molecular characterization for the copy number, for the expression, everything. And based on the molecular characterization and the glass house study, we, we selected 65 independent events. Um, 45 of them has the HRAP gene and 20 of them has the PFLP gene. And we planted them in, in the confined field trial in Uganda. Um, so uh, all this research actually we are doing in collaboration with NARO in Uganda. So we, we planted that, uh, and then our target was to do um, the disease evaluation for BXW, but also to do the agronomic performance to see whether they, they have the similar yield to the, uh, similar to the non-transgenic, because if the yield is affected, we are actually going nowhere. Uh, so what we did, this, is, this disease is actually spread um, through the insect, but you know, when we got the approval, uh, we were supposed to remove the, the flowers. We were not, we were supposed to like bag the uh, bananas until the flowers are removed. So that way we have to do artificial inoculation because this is basically is not a soil borne pathogen. It, it uh, normally stays only for few weeks uh, can survive in the soil, you know, after you remove the bananas. So we have again artificially inoculated uh, in the leaves. Uh, we use the pre-flowering stage of the plants and we inoculated them. And after that, actually, the picture was quite black and white. Several of you might have seen those bananas in the field. So, you know, we don't need to explain to them like which one are the control plants, which are the transgenic bananas and all, because the, the control plants got the symptom. Most of them didn't produce any fruits. Even though the fruits were produced, they were all symptomatic. Majority of the transgenic bananas actually didn't get any symptom. But, but that was obvious because they came out from the, after screening in the glass house. Uh, so we tested these plants for three generations, the mother plant and the two return crop. We inoculated the first uh, time, the mother plant, but the second time we, we, were, uh, we inoculated actually also the first return, but then after that, we didn't inoculate it because there was, uh, what we observed that, you know, between the connection between the mother and the return plant, that was giving the pathogen to the return already. And as you can see that, that hole in the control, that there was the plants there, but as soon as the, these suckers were coming up, they were all dying off because there was enough pathogen there. So these are the pictures of the transgenic and the non-transgenic bananas. As I said, you know, control plants, majority of plants didn't produce any, any bananas because we inoculated them at the pre-flowering stage and they all died. Uh, but even though the bananas, uh, the bunches were produced, they were all symptomatic. So what we also did was 
uh, we also checked for the yellow ooze. The lower panel is the non-transgenic banana, and the upper panel is the transgenic banana. So we didn't find any, any pathogen or any ooze in the, in the promising lines of the transgenic bananas. Um, so we published this in, uh, in Nature Biotech. Uh, and so what we found is that the result actually for the three generation was quite surprising. You know, there were 11 lines which has resistance in, in the mother plant as well as all the generations. So that was like a stable trait. We find some additional like five, six lines which have um, like, you know, the, the, only the leaf which has been inoculated got the symptom, no symptom, uh, further spread of the symptom. But when it come to the return crop, there was no symptom at all. So we had those type of lines. We have also some of the lines where like, but those were very few plants that where there was no symptom in the mother plant, but there were symptoms in the, in, in the progenies. But we have 11 lines were good enough for us to move, uh, move further. Uh, and, and then, as we said, we were checking the plant morphology. So these, these lines, the good lines, has no significant difference. They look normal. Um, and also the yield parameters. So for, for the uh, morphology, actually, we were not only by the look. We were, we were actually measuring. We were counting the number of days to flower, um, uh, the height of the plant, the, actually the leaf area, uh, and the pseudostem girth. And there was no significant difference. For the yield also, we, were, we, were, uh, we, we weighed the bunches. This was bunch weight, the number of fingers, the, and, and there was no thing. So you know, like I said, that we were using two different uh, varieties, so we, we compared actually the transgenic of one variety with the tra non-transgenic of the similar variety. And the point which I would like to make here is, for the yield, actually we compared the inoculated transgenic bananas with the non-inoculated control bananas. Because you know that the inoculated control bananas died, you know, so that was the comparison. And then after that, I was quite curious to know like what's happening, why the sum of the bananas has the partial resistance, some has the full resistance. So we wanted to see uh, whether there is a difference in the expression. So we did the QRT-PCR. We picked some lines which was showing the partial resistance and, and the lines with the 100%. But we find no correlation in them. Uh, what, so, you know, which was not surprising because most of these hypersensitive response genes, you really need a small expression which is enough to provide the, the full, full resistance. And that's what we confirm from there. Because this was the first trial for me, um, uh, so I was also, for, in, for the curiosity, I, I also wanted to see, like, you know, the stability of the presence of the gene and the expression of the gene, you know, what's happening. So every six months, actually, we were doing the PCR and the, and the RT-PCR on, on these plants, and we actually found that the trait was quite stable and the genes were stably present, therefore, for three years. Um, after that, we went back to the regulators. We said we want to do the second trial. And they gave us the approval for 10 lines. So we did the, the second trial with 10 lines with more replicates. And the result was the same. This time, all the 10 lines retained the resistance, 100% resistance. We tested them for two more years. So, so far, actually, we have the result for five years in the field with five generation. And then the trait is quite stable. And we are actually now moving to the product development. So we have proof of concept where we have done um, the gene delivery establishment. The, uh, uh, means I think we have actually put the baseline for everything. And now we are more into the variety. We are not developing one because farmers doesn't grow one variety. We are actually developing five varieties. Uh, we are actually, we have recently got the approval for multi-location trial in Uganda for, for starting the trial in three different locations. We are also waiting for the approval from, uh, from Kenya uh, for going for the, for the field trial in Kenya uh, as well. So, but the, another thing what we are doing is, you know, the single gene-based resistance is risky. So we are now stacking the genes together. So now whatever we are going to the field actually is with the stacked genes together. We have developed the lines for the, all the five varieties. Um, we have tested them in the glass house, identified the best lines to go into the field, and like in a month or two months' time, actually, we will be planting the trials both in Uganda and Kenya. And if everything goes well, our plan is by 2020 or 2021, actually, the product will be ready for deregulation. 
uh, in Uganda and Kenya. Maybe by that time, uh, the law will be in place in Uganda. In Kenya, there is already a law. Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, we have done uh, the, uh, the biosafety analysis using the bioinformatics, and there is actually no convincing evidence to say that, you know, there is any alarming thing there. Uh, initially, I did it myself, but then, you know, to get the regulator's confidence, we also did through the third party. So Richard Goodman did, did that for us. The good thing is, like, the, a team of the socioeconomist from IATA did the Accenture impact analysis. And I was very happy to see that there are 65% farmers who say that, you know, they will adopt these bananas immediately as soon as they are, they are ready. There are 19% which says that, okay, they will do it later after that they see how they are performing in, in their neighbor's field. There are only 16% who says that, you know, they will never, they might change their mind as well. Um, and then, uh, so, as I said, you know, this disease was reported on... NSET, so Ethiopia is, still has a problem on NSET with this. So we were approached by Gates Foundation that if we can help Ethiopians for developing, transferring this technology to NSET, and that's what we are working on with EIR in Ethiopia, and we are transferring these two genes into, into NSET. My next story is, which I will go very quickly, is on nematodes. Um, and I know like yesterday somebody was saying there are genes. Yes, I agree, there are genes, you know, but there is not one nematode in the soil. There are a lot of nematodes at one point, at one place, you know. So the, in bananas, there are, are genes, but they are particularly provide resistance only to rhodophyllus, but rhodophyllus is not the only one in the soil. So we are working, uh, uh, and here IIT is working with University of Leeds in UK, and we are trying to actually develop um, the broad spectrum resistance for the nematodes using two different technology. One is the synthetic repellent, uh, this, is a, this is a peptide, and also uh, another one is an antifedin, which is a cystatin. Um, we did the same thing, uh, the, developed the transgenic bananas, and, uh, and so in this case we used plantain. Um, we tested them with the molecular analysis, did the glasshouse assay, and then identified the best lines and, and, and did the trial. It, again in Uganda, so we, we planted 12 different lines uh, in Uganda with, with, with uh, a, a transgenic plantain, and, and the result was, was good there as well, you know. So um, we used three different things like peptide alone, cystatin alone, and, and the stacked ones. And the interesting result here is actually we found better result where we had the had the peptide alone in comparison to the when we have stacked these two genes. Um, we have a few lines which has actually more than 90% uh, resistance um, uh, under the field condition. Uh, so right now what we are trying to do is, so initially we use the, the constitutive promoter, for, but for the nematode you don't need to use the constitutive promoter. So um, we, we are actually, uh, uh, we tested uh, some root cap specific promoter, uh, which we have also recently published, and, and there is a maize root cap a promoter which can actually, you can express the gene only at the tip of the root, and that's enough to actually express the repellent. So right now we are planning to use this promoter to drive uh, a repellent and, and then uh, go for the, for the product development uh, from this. So in conclusion, uh, I would like to say that uh, GM approaches shows enormous potential uh, and I think the, 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 which, the point which didn't come out yesterday was one trait is, is good, but, you know, stacking the different traits. You know, like in bananas, there are five or six different problems. So if we can make a super banana by stacking all these five, six traits together, that's our goal. So we already started working on some of those traits together. I didn't have the time to actually talk about that. Uh, there are several products uh, on horizon for Africa, but, but BXW resistant banana is one of them, and, and our target is actually to deregulate that by, by 2021. So in the end, I would like to acknowledge all my partners uh, from the national program, AATF, Academia Seneca, and also the financial support uh, from different uh, donors, and, and then uh, last but not least, my team working with me. Thank you very much. Um, 
Thanks, Lena. I'm one of the people who's had the benefit of actually seeing your transgenic yeah. bananas in the, um, in the field at Narrow. Um, it's, what's interesting is how difficult the political situation is in, in Uganda, and you're very familiar with this, of course. What I don't understand is how it's possible for the field trials to be approved. So there is a regulatory process for considering genetically modified crops, and yet all of your colleagues seem to be of the opinion that there must be a biosafety law passed in order for there to be com you know, co wide commercialization. Now, why, why, why are you able to proceed with field trials, but you, you consider it's not possible to proceed with commercialization? Why not proceed with commercialization even under the current regulatory system? Yeah, so actually, Uganda has the biosafety guideline in place, and the guidelines allows the confined field trial. So right now, the open field trials are not, uh, are not allowed there. So like you can go multi-location trial, but they all need to be confined. So it's expensive, but you can do your research. But for the deregulation and commercialization, you need the law in place, which is right now in Uganda is not there. I hope I have answered your thing. Time for one quick question, if anybody has one. Hearing none, let's thank Dr. Trapathy. So um, I just wanted to clarify, uh, Alina, what the mode of action of the uh, ferrodoxin-like um, um, gene that you, you're using for uh, xanthomonas wilt resistance, how does it actually function against the bacterium? So actually, the, it, it, it activates this oxygen burst. And, oh, okay. And, okay. Yeah, so, yeah, so that's how, actually, it's a defense, defense right. gene. Yeah. Um, and, and that's how it works. So, you know, it has right. the oxidative burst, which, uh, which then leads to the systemic acquired resistance. Okay. So that's it's ROS how. mechanism. Yes, yes, yeah, it yeah. is. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. AOS method, yeah. Sure. yeah. Let's thank Lena once again. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Our second speaker this afternoon in our